Hey, this is Susie Daphnis of the Australian Business Women's Network, and today we're talking about productivity with Graham Orcott, who's the author of The Productivity Ninja. Graham runs his own business, Think Productive, which trains some of the leading organisations across the world in productivity. He's a speaker, he's a social entrepreneur, and he's a productivity ninja. We work with thousands of women in business each year, and I often hear that they are overwhelmed by the amount of work they have, what they need to get through, and each day they're fighting to stay on top of their to-dos. They're stressed and they're busy, and their dream to create a great business is thwarted by an overflowing inbox or just too many things to focus on. I'm often in the same boat, and that's why I was really excited to interview Graham and get some effective ideas on managing productivity. Let's now go to the interview, after which I'll give you details on how to get a copy of the book, and I'll also give you a few more details and insights into getting on top of your productivity and where to find additional resources and support. You'll find notes and links from today's interview on our website at www.abn.org.au forward slash herbusiness forward slash ninja. Thanks for listening. Graham, hi and welcome to the program. Hi, good to be here. Thank you so much for joining us to speak about How to Be a Productivity Ninja, which is your book. Start us off by giving us your definition of productivity. So I'd say productivity for me is about achieving what you want to achieve and making the change that you want to make, uh, but also doing it for the least possible effort. So um, it's not about trying to tick everything off a to-do list, um, but it is about being conscious of the decisions you make and how you make that change in the world. Now, what I like about your definition is that it's quite holistic. It's not, as you said, about getting everything done, ticking everything off the list, which is kind of traditional time management. Why is it that those traditional time management techniques don't work today? Well, I think, I mean, we certainly come across a lot of people who have been on some kind of time management training course and they don't necessarily feel like it's changed their life. Um, I think some of those techniques, you know, certainly have a value. um, But I think a lot of what is taught on time management courses is stuff that, you know, it was from the 70s and 80s and it was, you know, so it was written in an era when, information overload looked like six pieces of A4 paper in a pigeonhole, you know, and it's like time has moved on. And I think, you know, a lot of those, um, a lot of those models are great if all of your information input has come first thing in the morning and you have the whole day to then, you know, to, to, to sort of play with in terms of what you prioritize. But I think, you know, things move so quickly and, you know, really we're having to constantly interact with all, all the information around our work and make very quick and agile, you know, um, sort of decisions that, that, that will change, and, you know, in an hour's time. Um, so, I, you know, I, th- I think it's that sort of need to react very quickly and deal with information that, that kind of makes, I think, productivity a, a more kind of interesting, you know, and sort of relevant topic than time management. Mm. Well, one of the things that we do is each year we work with thousands of small business owners and we find the issue of managing time and workload one that is excruciating. You know, they're wearing mm-hmm. many hats and they get quite stressed about their inability to be productive. Could you tell us how stress and that scenario of being both the boss and worker can be a barrier to productivity? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, in in the sort of standard, um, you know, sort of stand, standard role 20 or 30 years ago, it would have probably been much more defined in terms of what are the things that you need to achieve, how do you achieve those things, you know, and, and you know, most of the decisions that you would uh, sort of have made for you in your job are made by your boss. Um, but I think these days, you know, most of us deal with, roles where we're simultaneously the boss and the worker all at the same time. So in my book, I talk about this idea of, you know, you have a boss self and you have a worker self and you have your boss self is there to, you know, to define the work and to be the person who is, you know, making those critical decisions and judgments. And then you have a worker self that actually has to get some work done. So, you know, it's about trying to um, flip between those two roles and really just be conscious that you do have two roles in, you know, in, in whatever job you're doing. And certainly if you're a a small business owner, you know, you have work that you actually have to deliver to get paid, right? But you also have 
a whole series of things that you need to do you know, to sort of make sure the business is, is, is working well and be thinking about strategy and you know, be thinking about different priorities and stuff at the same time. Mm. One of the concepts you introduce us to is not time management, but attention management. And I'm going to come back and talk about that mm. in a little while. But first, I want to talk about these nine ninja qualities you introduce us to. I have chosen three for us to talk a little more in depth about. Okay. Um, and so the first one, uh, well, I started to choose some of these and I wondered if it said something about my personality, but the first <laughs> one, the first one is, that I've chosen, it's certainly not the first one on your list, is ruthlessness. Could you talk to us about ruthlessness and the 80-20 rule? Yeah, so, and, and so I'm wondering if, Susie, these are things that you've chosen because they most resonate with you or, the ones, that you, <laughs> the, or, or the ones that you most need to work on. It could be either of those things, couldn't it? <laughs> But um, yeah, so ruthlessness, um, it's, the one, it's the one that, so we have a little postcard with our nine characteristics on. It's the one that uh, often jumps out at people, oh, ruthlessness. Um, and it has quite a, a sort of polarizing reaction. Some people go, yeah, I get that. I need to be more ruthless. And other people have this whole thing of like, oh, I don't want to be ruthless. You know, it sort of has mm. this um, slightly negative quality to it as well. But um, I'm not really talking about being ruthless with other people. What I'm talking about is being ruthless with yourself and ruthless with information. So if you think about email, um, so the 80-20 rule is a really great rule of thumb in, you know, in, in, in lots, of, lots of scenarios, particularly at work. So if, if you think you know, 20% of, of what you do is the stuff that adds 80% of the value, um, what's interesting about email is it's more like 820 with email. So you have this whole thing of, you know, I mean, we do a lot of work with people where we, um, we run uh, productivity workshops, and one of them is about getting your email inbox to zero. And we will, it's uncanny how many times we start with someone with 800 emails, and at the end, there are 20 left that actually mean something. You know, so this idea of 820 is, you know, it, it, it's, it's kind of really stark. And what that tells me is that in terms of being ruthless with your attention, mm. you know, like if you've got things popping up on your screen every time an email comes in or if you're spending a lot of your time getting distracted by, you know, social media notifications and things like that, then actually, you know, like, you, like you're setting yourself up, self up to fail because if only 20 of those 800 things really matter, you know, you really want to have um, a very ruthless attitude about all of that stuff in general. Mm. Guilty. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the next one I chose was stealth and camouflage. And in the book, you say protect your attention and ensure it's spent on what you decide to spend it on, not mm. what others hijack it for. Could you tell us about that? Well, I suppose the best example of that would be um, if you think about what do, how do most people start their day? So if you think about if you're in bed and you're just waking up, um, probably your alarm clock is on your phone and you turn the alarm clock off and one of the first things that springs up on your phone is usually the email inbox. So straight away, you know, there's so many people who are starting their day with everybody else's priorities and not their own. And I think, you know, for me... Like, I, I know I'm very guilty of this stuff, too, so I have to really um, be quite strict with myself in terms of, you know, so I don't have email on my phone, for example, and that's just kind of one you thing don't? for me. don't? No, I mean, I, I have deliberately turned it off and intentionally turned it off. So I still have it on my laptop, and it's, I also have an iPad, which is with me most of the time, but I, st I still have the act of having to go into the iPad to be able to see email, and that's, it's a big, you know, thing for me is putting that barrier in place. Um, but that's just, that's just kind of one example example of it. But I think it's very easy for people to to get into this um, sort of cycle where you know you're you're very um, reactive to other people's uh, you know uh, other people's whims basically. So other other people put things on email. Other people arrive at your desk and so on and so forth. And unless you've been proactive in thinking about um, you know, like the, unless you're really grounded in what what are your set of commitments, like what are your things that you need to achieve by five o'clock or by the end of this week or by the end of this year, then it's it's really easy to be tempted into into dealing with other people's scenarios rather than your own. Mm. And of course, you're not saying you know uh, that we're not personally responsible that you know other people are keeping us from being productive. Uh, I guess that goes back to being ruthless and committed uh, to what we say we're going to do. Yeah, and I think also the, the stealth and clam camouflage thing comes from, um, you know, this whole, I, I, I really call it a, a disease, which is the disease of the open plan office. So, you know, for those people who, you know, particularly work in, in sort of larger businesses, but I think this is equally as, 
as applicable to, to small businesses too, is, you know, like we are surrounded by so many different interruptions. And there are certainly times where the kind of quality thinking that your boss self needs to do, like, you know, if you really need to think about strategy, if you really need to solve difficult problems, then it's, it's really hard to do that if you're being interrupted every 10 minutes. So stealth and camouflage is really about kind of getting out of the way, recognizing that you can unplug from technology, recognizing that sometimes you can do work, you know, equally better if you're sat in a coffee shop where no one knows where you are. Uh, than if you're like in an office or at your desk or plugged into your phone and email. Mm. In the uh, chapter or section about mindfulness, you Mm. speak to us about our minds being our most important tool and how being emotionally intelligent and self-aware is important for many reasons, but including, of course, productivity. You quote two of my very favourite authors, Seth Godin and Stephen Pressfield, both Mm. of whom have written on the subject of the mind and its role in productivity in getting things done. Give us a quick overview of the ninja concept of mindfulness so i mean i suppose there's there's so much you can say about mindfulness i think um for me mindfulness is you know i mean it, it can be a tool in so many ways to producing productivity but for me it's a bit more than that it's it's about a a, a regular practice of of sitting and noticing um, a particular moment you know so uh, we, within uh, Think Productive, we actually have a daily meditation practice, which is, you know, the whole office basically stops at 11.30 in the morning. And we have this, this is really brilliant little app, which you can download, which is called Headspace. Mm. Um, and it runs these really nice little 10-minute um, meditations and then 15-minute meditations and then 20. Um, and we do a 15-minute one every day. And the, the amazing thing about that is, you know, once you start to, to get into a regular practice around meditation just it, it's really interesting what your mind starts to to focus on and what your attention is drawn towards versus away from um, and I really notice now if I'm like if I'm not doing you know at, at least sort of 10 or 15 minute minute meditation regularly you know I really start to notice myself getting a little bit kind of foggy in my own brain but I think um, like in terms of also what this means for productivity I think You know, being self-aware for me is also about asking yourself really good questions. So, you know, I I like to think of, um, you know, like for for me, one of the questions first thing in the morning is always, what's my energy like today? And and really just how am I feeling? And, you know, I think introducing that kind of, um, you know, sort of set of questions and considerations into productivity is something that I think is quite sort of alien to lots of people. But, you know, I I think there's so much to it. And I think it's, it's one of the most overlooked elements of productivity is ourselves and our feelings and motivations and you know like and the energy that we have you know to bring to any particular day Hmm. these of course are only three of nine ninja qualities that you go into in your book i won't go through all of them i do want people to know though that each one is unique and i found very very applicable what i want to do at this stage is look at some of the other big areas of the book um you devote an entire chapter to doing email like a ninja with so much more advanced technology available than email why does this technology get so much airtime if you like in the book um well well two questions for you on that so the first is uh what's more advanced than email in terms of its day-to-day uh, use, <laughs> but, but I suppose the second question is is also uh, what is the thing that people spend more time on than email? Like for me, it's the thing that people uh, certainly articulate when you know when they when they come to me saying they have a productivity problem. Um, often I say, oh yeah, tell me more about that, and immediately they tell me they have an email problem. <laughs> so I think e- email is a big thing there, you know. So and I think in terms of like more advanced technology. Um, see, I don't think so. Instant messaging, which um, has come to a lot of companies in the last few years, mm. um, for me feels like a really big mistake. So it's like you know, people treat email as an instant medium anyway. You know, people sort of expect this kind of instant response right. on, on email. Mm. And so, what what do companies do when you're not responding to email within two seconds? They introduce another layer, which is instant <laughs> messaging, on top of email. So I, I think a lot of the other technologies are actually they might be more advanced because they're in, in the sense that they're new, 
but like I, I'm not sure that that some of those technologies are actually doing what they're, uh, you know, what what the bosses of companies are expecting them to do. Okay, understand all of that. Um, I guess what I what it meant to me to see a whole chapter is that it remains a problem for most people. Massively, absolutely, mm. yeah. And I, yeah, no one comes to me and says. Uh, I have a massive I am problem. <laughs> it's a massive email problem. People do say I have a massive social media problem. I hear that one. <laughs> yeah, social media problem. That's very true. Um, and I think some of the stealth and camouflage stuff um, in the book. You know, just thinking about your own, uh, your attention and your and your sort of day to day intentions around that is is pretty key. But coming back to email, I think you know in terms of. Like, how do people deal with that? Um, one of the big stresses of email comes from the uncertainty of what might be in your inbox. So, you know, grasping with that and getting systems that allow you to very quickly come back to that point, even when there's always new email piling up, is the key thing. So, you know, we talk about in the in the Ninja email uh, chapter there and on, on Think Productive's workshops, which is my um, workshop company, you know, we talk about getting your inbox to zero and the idea of regularly coming back to, um, you know, a position where, you, where you're completely aware of, of, you know, what's on your plate and what are the things that you still need to do. So most of that chapter is, is kind of, you know, it's, it's really devoted to that whole uh, concept and doing that as effortlessly, effortlessly as possible. Mm. Um, and I think a lot of people think that, that, you know, keeping and getting your inbox to zero is, you know, a, re- a hugely kind of unobtainable goal. Um, it's actually, you know, it, it's quite a simple process. And the Ninja email um, chapter in the book, um, you know, basically with, with that chapter in front of you and a couple of hours of your time concentrated on that, then, you know, the vast majority of people can get their inboxes zero very, very quickly. I was going to say, actually, for, for those listening, um, certainly I recommend um, the book in its entirety. But if you just did what's in that chapter, I would say for most of us, our productivity would be turned on its head. I've had lots of people email me exactly that. So it's like, you know, I, I read the book. I liked all the rest of it. But man, that chapter is so one. You know? <laughs> so, uh, certainly something that the feedback that we've had. And really that chapter comes from, so we've been teaching um, workshops in companies big and small um, with individuals, with government departments in the UK, um, you know, a whole, whole sort of range of different organizations. And really that chapter was me taking, you know, like step by step the process of that three hour workshop and putting it in a chapter in a book. So it, it literally is the stuff that we you get paid a lot of money to go and deliver to big companies. And it's, you know, it's, it's all there in that chapter of the book. All right, very good. Now, there's an area that women traditionally really pride themselves on being good at, <laughs> and that is multitasking. But a <laughs> lot, <laughs> but a lot is you know, and we say we do it better than men, and men can't multitask. Mm. But maybe they're onto something because so, much has been said in the news lately about multitasking actually being quite ineffective. Could you mm. share your views on the idea of monotasking? Yeah. So in the book, I talk about monotasking and this idea of um, doing one thing. Um, one thing only, up until the point that it's it's reached a natural conclusion or completion, and then moving on to the next thing. Um, we so coming back to um, the workshops that we run, we'll often talk to people who say, "I'm really good at multitasking." And then part of what we do with the workshops is we work with people at their desks. And um, I had this one person who said to me, "I think I'm really really good at, at multitasking." And I said, "Oh yeah, like let's open up your uh, your outlook and, and let's see." Um, and on their screen, they had about 17 or 18 sort of incomplete emails in different windows all around the screen, you know, and, and it was um, that person and a couple of other people, sort of their colleagues that were standing around, and everyone went, so you're very good at multi-not completing these <laughs> things. You know? and it's, like, it's, uh, it, it, it's a hugely um, stressful way of working. Um, most of the time, what you can't actually do is is multitask in the literal sense of that word. So what you can do is focus on one thing and then move your focus to something else and then move your focus to something else again. Um, And what that means in terms of efficiency is that you're probably going to come back and focus on the same thing three or four times within that cycle. You know, you know, focus on the, you know thing number one. Focus on thing number two. Come back to thing number one again. Move to thing number three. You know, you're constantly flitting around, and that's a very inefficient way of working. Mm-hmm. It's also a very tiring way of working because there's a setup time involved with every single thing you do. Even if it's just you know going back to a particular email that you were writing half an hour ago, 
you still got to get back into the mode of, okay, who's that, that person that I'm talking to? And what was the conversation again? And, you know, so you have to do that, that little bit of thinking every time mm. in terms of reminding yourself, you know, what you're going to do next and, you know, what's at stake here and so on and so forth. Right. So, so, um, waste, so I think obviously. monotasking is just, yeah, monotasking, I think is just, it's just much more, it's much more efficient and also much more healthy in terms of, you know, like, how, how you manage your attention and, and, you know, keeping your stress levels down too. Mm. Now, we've been talking for about 18 minutes and we haven't even got to the meat in the book. <laughs> <laughs> so, and so I want to just very quickly give people a sense of um, what happens next. So a good part of the book is about developing the habits. Um, you refer to them under the acronym CORD, C-O-R-D, and as an overview for our listeners, the C-O-R-D, uh, D stand for capture and collect, organize, review, and do. You tell us the actions to take. You give us fantastic resources for the tools to use, and you even provide us the checklists to follow. Tell us what we can expect when we get to this part of the book. Yeah, so, I mean, like, I suppose very, very simply, um, those four chapters of the book, Capture and Collect, Organize, Review, and Do, are really, you know, f- for me, they're the sort of key habits in taking – any piece of information and and following that you know following that through from when you first receive it to when it's done um, so the first thing you've got to do is actually you know capture that information collect it get it out of your head basically get it into you know some kind of you know paper system or some kind of app or you know um, some, something where you can actually start to view um, all of those different priorities and commitments and projects together um, organizing is for me about asking yourself a series of, you know, really useful questions. So, um, you know, the, 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 the first question there um, for me is always, is there an action here worth doing? And those last two words are the, are the most important in that, right. in that little phrase. So is there an action worth doing? Um, there are so many things that we, uh, could, you know, could instinctively say yes, there's an action here, um, but actually don't add much value. So, again, coming back to the ruthlessness thing, um, and then there's a whole series of other questions around that. Um, review is then about taking stock of all the things that you could be doing and making good decisions around it. And then there's, um, I talk about the daily and weekly review. Um, and so, you know, coming back and, and asking yourself those, those really good questions in terms of your own energy and in terms of what you want to do next with each of those projects and, you know, and really kind of um, keeping on top and keeping agile in terms of what you're actually working on. And then the do part is really a kind of, a kind of um, collection of um, bits of, of what I call do psychology. So, you know, just thinking about some of the things that um, weigh us down, like procrastination and, uh, and, 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 you know, not having, you know, good levels of energy at particular times of the day and things like that. So, so the, the, do, the do chapter is really, uh, you know, how to develop some of those habits and, um, you know, and, and how to kind of keep momentum going at key times of the day. So there's over 100 pages of really practical information covering those four areas that you just mentioned. So there's more than enough tools in the book for people to be really on their way. But what I want to ask you is when we let go of the reasons that we have on why we're not doing what we want to do, what we really need to do to get where we want to go, when we let go of all that, what in your mind is possible for us? Wow. <laughs> Love the question, first of all. <laughs> What's possible for us? Wow. Well, I think um, so that the ninth characteristic of the Productivity Ninja is that a Productivity Ninja is not a superhero. Um, so a Productivity Ninja will often appear like a superhero, but you're not a superhero. So um, what I mean by that is, you know, we often have this front that we put up in our work. And particularly, if, you know, if you're a small business owner, and you've got really, you know, tight-knit and key relationships with clients, with suppliers, you know, like with, with all the kind of people that you work with, it really sort of, you know, small, small teams and, and, and colleagues who are really reliant on stuff. It's very easy to try and, and sort of portray yourself as the superhero the whole time. Mm. And I think immediately what that starts to do is it creates guilt, it creates panic, and it creates this, um, you know, like, like you say, this, this kind of, real feeling of, of, you know, beating yourself up for every single thing that you don't get done rather than sort of thinking about the things that you do do. Um, what's interesting to me is that um, all those other people that you think of as superheroes, they're human too. You know, so um, I, I love the, 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 the thought of, 
you know, someone like Barack Obama or Richard Branson just like cowering at having to give <laughs> a big speech or presentation. And guess what? They will do that, you know? So I think what's interesting to me is that like everyone comes at productivity with, you know, with some kind of like human failing or, or foible or, you know, something that's going to get in their way and has to overcome that stuff. And what's interesting to me is that, you know, if, if they can do it, so can you. And, you know, if they can be, uh, you know, creating massive impact in the world, then so can you too. So I think, you know, for me, the, the you know, the, the end of the book and also my, my whole kind of take on productivity in general is, you know, don't beat yourself up. Um, think about, uh, you know, valuing and, um, and celebrating the things that you do really well. And if occasionally one or two things slip, then don't beat yourself up about that. Mm, I think that's a really nice place to end. The book is How to Be a Productivity Ninja, Worry Less, Achieve More, Love What You Do. Graeme Alcott, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Her Business with Graham Orcott, author of How to Be a Productivity Ninja. The book is published by Icon Books and you can pick up a copy at all good bookstores and also on Graham's website, which is thinkproductive.co.uk. You'll find more details about this interview on our website at abn.org.au forward slash herbusiness forward slash ninja. One of the things that I find helps keep me on track with being productive is being accountable to peers. And by telling someone what I'm going to achieve and by when, I'm motivated to make things happen. And I do this in a couple of contexts. Firstly, I have a business advisory board, a group of people that I meet with multiple times a year. And in each meeting, we set strategic goals on everything from financials to business development to new products. I have a second group that is a small group of entrepreneurs. And what we have in common is a love of marketing and blogging. And so through our meetings throughout the year, we introduce each other to productivity tools and to ideas that help us be more productive in the areas of marketing our businesses and also in running them. So if you don't have an advisory board or mastermind group, um, I'd like to suggest that you find four or five other people who are in a similar business situation to you and see if you can form a group that meets on a you know, maybe bi-monthly basis, perhaps monthly, whatever suits the group, and that you set your priorities and check in with each other. Premium members of the Australian Business Women's Network kind of have this done for them. We meet four times a year to work on strategy and focus on what we want to achieve. And what amazes me is what happens between those quarterly meetings, how productive people get, especially in the week leading up to when we're going to meet again. You can learn more about our Entrepreneurs Roundtables on our website at www abn.org.au. If you have a look under the events and training section, you'll see when the next roundtables are being held. I truly believe that you want to achieve great things. So do what you can do to support yourself and to stop your efforts being sabotaged by bad habits. Thanks again for listening. And thanks to my guest, Graham Orcott, the author of How to Be a Productivity Ninja. I really recommend you pick up a copy of the book. And again, you'll find more details at abn.org.au forward slash her business forward slash ninja. Now, if you enjoyed this episode, I'd really appreciate it if you would tell your friends. We want to share the great ideas that our guests, like Graham, bring to these interviews, and we want to get the word out as far as possible. Also, if you're listening on iTunes, be sure to subscribe to automatically receive new episodes of Her Business and to access the library of past episodes. And finally, we'd love it if you would leave us a review on iTunes. It lets others know that you enjoyed the show and helps us spread the word. I'll put a link on our website page to help you do that. On behalf of the Australian Business Women's Network, I want to thank you so much for joining us on here on Her Business and look forward to welcoming you back again real soon. Thanks for listening.